preservation of and increased access to the 92nd Street Y Humanities Audio Archives is generously funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. I remember the first time I was on this platform was in 1953, and I didn't have to take out my glasses. <laughs> it was through my friend, the poet Cecil Hemley, that I first heard of Mr. Singer's fiction. Indeed, I first met the writer at a party for Cecil's literary magazine, Noonday, to which Mr. Singer contributed. Like other apprentice Jewish-American writers in those years, immediately following World War II, I wondered what could be done to memorialize the vanished past, the Jews of Europe, those children of the wind whose frozen and rutted landscape I had seen only from a bombing plane at 20,000 feet. With our divided souls and conflicting ambitions, what we were to accomplish in the years to come was patchwork. It was this writer from Poland who was to capture these children of the wind, who out of the smoke of Europe was to give shape and substance to a vanished world. Though this was never to be his intention, and indeed was an intention he officially disclaimed. Still, out of his own fractured beginnings, Isaac Besheva Singer had found a unity of soul that was to enable him to do the great work. The house wreckers had left the door and a staircase. Now leading to the empty room of night, Mr. Singer was to people a world. For a writer so rooted in the past, in the act of remembering, which is a primary Jewish tradition, there is still this remarkable freedom, a kind of looseness of flying in space, Miami Beach, South America, the west side of Manhattan, a rootedness and a marvelous freedom. But that freedom we sense in his work is not only the freedom of a master artist, it is often the feverish freedom of a world-facing apocalypse, the fever in Shosha or in Satan and Gori, a condition of constant and dizzying change that Mr. Singer sees as a condition of life, as well he might, considering his biography and the events he has lived through. It is useful to remember that in so many of his stories, stories that have the shape of a simple parable or daydream, but are crammed with invention, marvelous detail, speech that is real, funny, often lyrical, there is a speedy and constant interchange going on. The demonic is internalized and made psychological, and the psychological is externalized and made demonic. Two worlds in constant interchange, each having its own validity, and that is the engine that drives his narrative. As Rabbi Nachman has said, the world is a revolving die and everything turns over, and man changes to angel, and angel to man, and the head to the foot, and the foot to the head, so all things turn over and revolve, this into that and that into this, what is above to what is beneath, and what is beneath to what is above, for in the root all is one, and in the transformation and return of things, redemption is enclosed. I wanted to tell some story to pay tribute to Mr. Singer's humanity and wit, but my favorite story is one that I've told to several people in this audience, but I'll tell it again and I apologize to them and to Mr. Singer. Uh, it was years ago, I went downtown to the Jewish Workmen's Circle for a discussion of Jewish-American writing. The participants were Isaac Besheva Singer, Irving Howe, and Harvey Suedos. Mr. Singer's talk that evening was on the importance of cultural roots, on the impossibility of any man achieving distinction in his field of work if he were to dissever himself from those roots. When the speakers were through, there was a question period. A man got up and said that he had a nephew, a splendid young man who had never gone to Cheda, who had no interest in his Jewishness, but who was now at Harvard, planning maybe to be a Supreme Court Justice. <laughs> Did Mr. Singer really mean to deny him that bright future? And he went on enumerating for about 15 minutes the sterling qualities of this nephew. When at last he sat down, Mr. Singer came forward and said quietly, I have a niece. From the little I have come to see of the world of literature, I understand that there are antagonisms in it, even hostilities. 
Yet all writers take some pleasure in the recognition that comes to an artist after a lifetime of splendid work. So all of us took pleasure in Mr. Singer's recent Nobel Prize for Literature. And for the poets who are so close to the writers of Yiddish and who cannot even be translated, there was a particular pleasure in Mr. Singer's laureate. To have written so that critics are pleased, even dazzled, and at the same time to have given joy to a great community of readers is a gift given to few men. It has been given to Isaac Besheva Singer. and gentlemen, I'm going to read to you a little memoir. I'm writing now a series of, uh, I don't know what I should call, stories or memoirs about the Writers' Club. In, in my work, I often mention the Writers' Club in Warsaw, the Yiddish Writers' Club. And I, after a while, I heard many people tell me that they would be more interested to hear what went on in a writer's club, in, especially in Warsaw, a Yiddish writer's club. And I write these kinds of uh, memoirs. And one of them, which I'm going to read you now, I called Van Wild Kava. This was the name of the man, kind of an unusual man for a, Yiddish, for a Yiddish writer. Unusual name, I mean. <laughs> if a Nobel Prize would exist, for writing little, Van Wild Kava would have gotten it. <laughs> during, during his lifetime, he published one tin brochure and a few articles. Half of the brochure consisted of writers' names and titles of books. <laughs> Just the same, he was a member of the Yiddish Writers' Club in Warsaw and even belonged to the Pen Club. <laughs> we had a Yiddish section of the Pen Club. When I ac acquired a guest card to the Writers' Club, Kave was already there for many years. He was known as a strange character and the most severe critic possible. He declared such Yiddish classics as Sholem Aleichem and Peretz to be half talents. <coughs> and Mendel and Mechesforim completely talentless. Sholem Ash he called a promising young man who didn't, who didn't keep his promise. <coughs> my brother I.J. Singer and my friend Aaron Zaitlin, he considered barely beginners. Like a school teacher, Kaver liked to express achievement in numbers, and he gave them both two sevenths, two sevenths, which means less than a one, while the biggest was five. I could not bargain with him about my brother, but I told him that Zaitlin was the closest thing to a master that I can think of. I compared him to such writers or poets as Edgar Allan Poe, Lermontov, and Slovatsky. But Kaveh's opinion, even of these poets, was not too high. <laughs> he, he found faults in every one. Van Wild Kave maintained that since civilization and culture are only some 5,000 years old, literature is still at the very beginning of its development, actually in its infancy. It may take another five or 10,000 years until a full-fledged literary genius might appear. <laughs> I argued that every artist must start from the beginning. Unlike science, art does not thrive on the information 
of others. But Kava replied, art has its mutations and selections, its own biological growth. It seemed unbelievable that such an angry critic could exist in the Warsaw Yiddish Writers Club. Reviewers in the Yiddish newspapers revealed at least half a dozen new talents every Friday in their book sections. They were as lenient as Kave was strict. After he was willing to grant me 300 as my rating, <laughs> quite lavish praise for a fledgling like myself, he, be he became acquainted and we had many conversations about literature. Kave pointed out to me that Tolstoy's War and Peace may be quite rich and accurate in description and dialogue, but poor in construction. <laughs> Dostoevsky had a greater vision than Tolstoy, but he only possessed a single accomplished work, Crime and Punishment. Shakespeare's value was only in his poetry, not as much in his sonnets as in the few poems that appear in his plays. <laughs> Cover admitted that as a primitive, Homer was quite readable. <laughs> He called Heine a, a jingle writer, a writer of jingles. In his brochure, he listed in, in, in his brochure, he listed all the literary and scientific works that needed to be translated into Yiddish in order of it to be more than a dialect. The Yiddishists attacked him as their worst enemy, but the professional translators praised him. Some literati felt that Kave should be thrown out of the Yiddish Writers Club, and others defended him by saying he was too ridiculous to be taken seriously. <laughs> Fate and Kave himself did their best to make him appear as a clown. He was small, emaciated, had a crooked mouth, and lisped out of its corner. The jokers in the writer's club specialized in mimicking Kaffe, his extreme understatements, his use of scientific phrases, and his pedantic style of talking. To Kaffe, Freud was a mere dilettante, and Nietzsche a would-be philosopher. <laughs> the literary wags gave Kaffe a nickname, Diogenes. Kaffe lived from pennies. His only source of income was to substitute the proofreaders of the Yiddish press when they went on their summer vacation. However, the typesetters completely ignored Kaveh's corrections. <laughs> since, he had his own, since he had his own concepts about grammar and syntax. <laughs> he brought entire encyclopedias, lexicos, and various dictionaries to the composing room. The editors maintained that if all of Kaveh's corrections would be followed up, the daily newspapers could appear only once in three months. <laughs> <coughs> Needless to say that Kaveh was an old bachelor. What woman would have married one such as Van Wilt Kaveh? Summer and winter, he wore a faded derby, a, co a coat down to his ankles, a stiff collar, which used to be called father murderer. It's the kind, it, it pressed the, the throat so tightly that it, it killed our fathers. <laughs> Not my father. <laughs> I was told that in his vest pocket, Kave kept a chronometer instead of a watch. If someone asked Kave what time it was, he would say, a minute and 21 seconds to five. <laughs> When he read proofs, he used a watchmaker's eyepiece. Kave <laughs> lived 
Kaveh lived in a tiny five-light walk-up attic room, all the walls lined with books. On his visit to the writer's club, he ordered nothing from the buffet, not even a glass of tea. He had discovered a bazaar where he could buy stale black bread, cheese and fruit for next to nothing. It was said that Kaveh washed his own linen and pressed it by laying it under the heavy volumes of his library. <laughs> still, still there was never a stain on his clothing. He had a system of sharpening razor blades on a glass. Van Wilt Kave was an ascetic, not in the name of religion, but in the name of his, of his version of worldliness. Suddenly the writer's club was shaken by a sensation. Kave married. And, and whom? A young and beautiful girl. One had to know the Yiddish writer's club in Warsaw and its passion for gossip to realize the uproar this piece of news created. <laughs> At first, everyone considered it a joke, but it soon became clear that it was no joke. The proofreaders and typesetters already had published their congratulations in their respective newspapers. One day, Kave brought his new wife to the writer's club at exactly the time he came every day, 17 minutes after 11. <laughs> she, seemed in her she seemed in her late 20s, was dressed fashionably, had dark short hair and polished nails. She spoke both Polish and Yiddish well. All those who were present that day in the, in the club, could, all they could do was gape. Kave ordered two glasses of coffee for himself and his beloved, and some cake. When the pair left, exactly 17 minutes after 12, the club began to buzz with excitement. A number of explanations and theories were created on the spot. <laughs> I only remember one of them, that Kave was a kind of a Yiddish Rasputin. A sexual miracle worker. <laughs> but this theory, but this theory was immediately dismissed as sheer nonsense. Every man in the writers' club considered all the other male members as impotent. <laughs> how, how could Kave be the exception? For days and weeks, the Yiddish Writers' Club was busy solving this riddle. But as quickly as a solution was found, it collapsed. Some of the writers knew, what I was, some of the writers knew that I was friendly with Kave. I had also gone up in his ratings a few fr fractions of a point. <laughs> and they insisted that I provide them with some insight but I was just as bewildered as all the others. No one would have dared to approach Kave and ask him any personal questions. There was a pride in this little man that did not allow for any intimacy. Then something happened. A girl whose home I visited had a friend from the town of Pulova. Pulova had a large printing shop where some Yiddish books were printed. It had also a large bookshop. And by the way, this is, uh, I, I once visited Pulover myself, and I, it was in a winter day, and I saw in the evening how the owner of the uh, bookshop locked the door with two locks. So I said to him, why do you need two locks? Who is going to break in in a, in a cold winter night and steal Yiddish books? And he said to me, I'm not afraid of people breaking in and stealing books. I'm afraid that authors may break in and put in more books. <laughs> the, 
The, the, the townspeople also boasted about having a few writers and translators. This girl from Pulover was a friend of Kava's wife, and one evening they both visited my girlfriend while I was there. It was an unexpected stroke of luck. I ate supper with a person who was a part of a great mystery. She seemed clever, tactful, and there was nothing enigmatic about her behavior. We discussed politics, literature, the literary group in Pulover. After supper, Mrs. Cover lit a cigarette and chatted with me while the other two girls washed the dishes. I said to her, I would like to ask you something, but don't be offended if it is too personal. You really don't have to answer me if... I know what you want to ask me, she interrupted. Why I married Kava. <laughs> Everybody is asking me the same thing. <laughs> I will tell you why. I wasn't born yesterday. I know men, but all the men I had the misfortune of meeting bought me stiff. Not one of them had an opinion of his own. They all said the usual things that young men say to girls. They repeated the editorials in the newspapers almost verbatim and read all the books which the reviewers recommended. Some of them offered to marry me, but how could I go and live with a man who made me yawn even at our first meeting? Conversation with a man is of high importance to me. Of course he must be a man, but this is not everything. Then I met Van Wilt Kava and I found all the qualities in him I was looking for since I grew up a person with knowledge and with opinions of his own. I began playing chess when I was 12, and I guess you know that Kava is, is a splendid chess player. He could have become a grandmaster if he would have devoted his time to it. Of course, he's older than I am and poor, but I never looked for riches. I make a living as a teacher and don't need to be supported. I don't know what you think of his writing, but I consider him a mighty good writer. Hopefully, near me, he will work on a regular basis and produce good works. That's all I can tell you. Every word of Mrs. Covers expressed decisiveness. It was the first time someone spoke about Cover without laughing at him and mocking his mannerisms. I told her I knew Cover and I admired his erudition and strong... Uh, Strong what? <laughs> and strong opinions. <laughs> Although they are somewhat overly extreme at times. She said to me, he's original, never banal. His trouble is that he writes in Yiddish. In another medium, he would be highly appreciated. <laughs> when I came to the writer's club the next day and told my cronies that I met Kava's wife, and repeated what she told me, they all looked disappointed. <laughs> One of them asked, how can you love someone like Kave? And I gave him the usual answer, no one has yet determined who can be loved and who cannot be. After a while, I stopped coming to the ha house of the girl where I met Kave's wife, and Kave's visits to the writer's club became less frequent than his bachelor years. The only news I heard about Kave was that he gave up his job as a substitute proofreader. I began to believe that Kave might mellow with this woman and perhaps write something of value. I had no doubt that the man possessed high literary potentials. A person who demands so much from others might also demand much of himself under the right circumstances. But then something happened so peculiar that I'm still puzzled by it 40 years later. A year or two had passed and my friend Arndt Seitlin, the poet, who became the editor of a three-monthly magazine, offered me a position as an associate editor. We were looking for an important essay about Yiddish literature or literature in general 
for the first issue, and I proposed that Zeitlin that cover write it. In the beginning, Zeitlin demurred. Cover for people, he said. First of all, it would take him a year or two. <laughs> Secondly, he will make mincemeat out of everybody. It will give us a bad name from the very beginning. But I answered, don't be so sure. My impression is that he has changed since he married. But even if he would tear everyone to pieces, we can always say that we disagree with him in a footnote. It might, it might even help the magazine to come out with something totally negative. <laughs> After long haggling, I managed to persuade Zeitlin to give it a try. But Zeitlin stipulated that Kaveh must agree to an eventual footnote, and he must also give a definite date of delivery. I was glad that Zeitlin let himself be persuaded. Somehow I felt that Kave might surprise us. It happened so that Kave came the next day to the writer's club. And when, and when I made this proposition to him, he seemed shaken. He said, you ask me to write, you ask me to write a leading article? I have been excommunicated from Yiddish literature for years. The name Kave was not kosher. Suddenly you choose me. I assured Kaveh that both Zaitlin and I have a high opinion of him. I pleaded with him not to demand the impossible from writers, and I also assured him that we would change nothing in his essay. If worse came to worse, we would add a footnote that we disagree. <laughs> After much hesitation, Kaveh agreed to write the essay and gave me a date of delivery. He promised that in no case would the essay be larger than 50 pages. I told Kaveh my premonition that this essay would be a turning point in his literary career. Kaveh listened, shrugged, and sat in his laconic way. Time will tell. The time to deliver the manuscript was closed, but we never heard a word from Kaveh. He stopped coming to the writer's club altogether, and this was a sign for me that he's busy working on the essay. One day I got a telephone call from him. He asked for a prolongation of two weeks to deliver the manuscript. I asked him how the work goes, and he said, I'm afraid it may be somewhat longer than 50 pages. <laughs> How much longer, I asked? Nine and three quarters of pages. I knew that Zeitler would be angry with me. Even 50 pages was too long, but I also knew that if our work is good, the reader and the critics would accept any length. There was a moment when I wanted to ask Cover to let me have a fragment of his work but I decided not to show impatience. When I told Satan what he had happened, what had happened, he said, I'm afraid Kaveh will bring us not 59 and, and three quarters pages, but 59 and three quarter lines. The day came and I met Kaveh in the writer's club. He brought the manuscript. It had exactly 59 and three quarter pages. I could see that the manuscript had many erosions, as well as quotations in German, French, and even in English, which would be a problem for a printer of a Yiddish magazine. <laughs> also, his lines were written too close together, so that the 59 and a three-quarter pages in Kaveh's longhand might be 80 pages in print. He said, I'm giving this to you under the condition that you don't read it here, but go home and read it by yourself. Only then can you give it to Zeitl. I took the manuscript and ran home as quickly as I could. I was possessed with the ambition to prove to Zeitlin that I was right. 
The moment I entered my furnished room, I threw myself on the sofa and began to read. I had read three or four pages and everything pleased me. Kavi began with a characterization of literature generally and then of Yiddish fiction specifically. The style was right, the sentences short and concise. I have never enjoyed reading a manuscript as much as those five pages. On page six, Kave wrote something about a full-blooded writer. He had put the expression in quotation marks, noting that this term is used to categorize races of horses, not to evaluate talent. It is odd that only in Yiddish of all languages that this idiom should be applied to levels of the mind. I read further and to my astonishment saw that Kavit dwelt too long on the explanation of this borrowed idiom. It is certainly a digression that could be caught, I thought, if Kavit would not mind. But the further I read, the more perplexed I became. Kavit had written an entire essay about horses. Arabian horses, Belgian horses, <laughs> race horses, Appaloosa horses. I read names which I had never heard. I, literal, I literally could not believe my own eyes. Perhaps I'm dreaming, I said to myself. I pinched my cheeks to make sure that it was not a nightmare. Van Wilt Kave had done excessive research, quoted scores of books for an article on horses. <laughs> they are physiology, anatomy, and behavior. They are various subspecies. He even added a bibliography. <laughs> Is he mad, I asked myself? Was this a game of spite? The idea that I will have to bring this manuscript to Zaitlin made me shudder. There was no question that I would have to break my word of honor and give back the manuscript to Kave. In all my anguish, I felt like laughing. After long brooding, I called Zaitlin. I will never forget Zaitlin's grimaces when he reached the pages where Kave began to elaborate the expression full-blooded. He lifted his yellowish eyebrows and never let them down until he finished. For a while, his face expressed a mixture of irony and disgust. Then I saw in his eyes something like the grief of a doctor when a patient comes to complain about a head cold and it turns out to be a malignant tumor. <laughs> he said to me, what did I tell you? How could you expect anything else from cover? I had no choice, I had to return the manuscript. I asked Kave why he did what he did and begged him to give me some explanation. He sat there motionless and pale. Then I heard him say, I told you I was excommunicated in Yiddish literature. Don't come to me anymore with invitations to write. I will have to live out my years without your magazine. There was a moment when I was tempted to call up Mrs. Carver and tell her of my predicament but I was sure that she knew about this essay and that she would defend him. Over the years, a distorted outlook on things may become contagious. It was kind of cover that he did not stop talking to me after that incident. Neither of us ever mentioned it. For many months, I got up in the middle of the night and pondered. Was this an act of masochism? Was it some sort of ins insanity? And if so, what kind? Schizophrenia? Paranoia? 
premature senility. <laughs> One thing was clear. Kave had put a huge amount of work into this useless essay. He knew that no one in the Yiddish circle had the slightest interest in horses. <laughs> Young as I was, I had already come to the conclusion that there are multitudes of human actions for which there is no motivation. As a matter of fact, in fiction, motivations always spoil the story. In 1935, in 1935, when I left for America, the Yiddish section of the pen club published my first novel, Satan in Gore. The executive board hired cover to do the proofreading <laughs> and to write a preface. I was afraid that Kave would find myriads of errors in my book and use the preface for some of his freakish conceptions. <laughs> but he made no special difficulties in the proofreading and his preface was short and to the point. No, Kave was not insane. I had a feeling that his treatise on horses was his last spree into the absurd. Just then, I left for America. Once in a while, I still try to fathom what might have been the meaning of Kave's bizarre act. But I know that if there is any, it dwells there where Van Wild Kave is now, in the so-called Great Beyond. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I promised to read another little story, and, and I'm going to do this. It's, this is, of course, so new. I have never, it was never published. It is, as, as I told you, a memoir. Please forgive me, I, I just mixed up the pages. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. It will take me a minute. <laughs> Although, as a rule, it takes me more than a minute. <laughs> but I will try for you. Ladies and gentlemen, I call this little story Sabbath in Gehenna, or the Shabbos in Gehenna, or you can call it Sabbath in Hell. It is, again, a, a, it's not a little memoir, but it is more or less a little, not to be taken seriously anyhow. <laughs> On the Sabbath, on the Sabbath, as it is known, the fires do not burn in Gehenna. The beds of nails are covered with sheets. The books on which the wicked males and females hang, by their tongues for gossip, by their hands for theft, by their breasts for lechery, by their feet for running for after sin, are concealed behind screens. The piles of coals and snow on which the transgressors are flung are hidden by curtains. The demons of destruction put away their fiery rods. The sinners who remain pious even in hell, they are such. Go to a little synagogue where an iniquitous cantor intones the Sabbath prayers. The free thinkers, there are many of them in Gehenna, <laughs> sit, 
sit on logs and converse. As is usually the case with enlightened ones, their topic is how to improve their lot, how to make a better Gehenna. <laughs> that wintry late Sabbath afternoon, a sinner named Yankee was saying, the trouble with us in hell is that we are selfish. Every sinner thinks only about his own business. If he believes that he can save his behind from a few lashes by the angel Duma, he is in seventh heaven. If we could create a united front, we would not be in need of private intercession. We would come out with demands. When Yankee uttered the words demands, his mouth began to water. He choked and puffed. Yankee was and remained a fat man with broad shoulders, a round belly, short legs. He had long hair around his bald spot and grew a beard. Not a kosher beard as the pious in paradise have, but a rebellious one. Every hair of which points at revolution. A little delinquent who braided his long hair in a ponytail, tied with a wire he tore out of a bed of nails, asked, what kind of demands come at Young? First, that the week in Gehenna should not last six days, but, but that we should have a four-day Gehenna week. Secondly, that each villain should get a six-week vacation <laughs> during which he should be permitted to return to earth and break the Ten Commandments without being punished. <laughs> Thirdly, that we should not be kept away from our beloved sisters, the female sinners. We will ask for sex and free love right here in Gehenna. Fourthly, dreams of a chopped off head, said Chaim Bonds, a former gangster. The angel Duma is not afraid of your demands and petitions. He does not even bother to read them. The saints in paradise use them for toilet paper. <laughs> what do you propose? I propose the angels like the humans understand one thing, blows. We must arm ourselves, rob out the angel Duma, storm the court of heaven, break a few ribs among the righteous. <laughs> then we must take over paradise, Leviathan, the wild dogs, the sanctified wine, all the other good things, and then arm ourselves, a petite bourgeois, who had fallen into hell for swindling, cried out, where will you get arms in hell? They don't give us a single knife or fork. <laughs> the fiery coals we eat, we have to pick up with our naked fingers. Besides, Gehenna does not last longer than a year, except for Sabbath and holidays. I am supposed to end my term on the day after Purim. If we begin a conspiracy now, the term may be prolonged. Do you know the punishment for conspiring against the angel Duma? This is the misfortune of us sinners, Yankee yelled out. Everyone is only for himself. How about the wicked who will come after us? <laughs> Every day new transports arrive. What will happen to them? This year is not so bad yet. It has 12 months. The next year will be a leap year all of 13 months. It is not my duty to worry about all the wicked in the world, replied the swindler. I happen to be an innocent victim. All I did was to forge a signature. I shed ink, not blood. Those who murder, set fire to houses, and cause children to perish in the flames, those who stab and rape, are not my brothers. If I were in charge here, I would keep them until the end 
of the year 6000. Didn't I say that every sinner thought for himself, young to spoke? If we cannot unite, the angels and demons can do to us as they please. In that case, why the idle talk? Let's play cards and finish out the rest of the Sabbath. Comrade Yankee, a sinner with eyeglasses, spoke up. May I say something? Say, talk doesn't change anything. My opinion is that we should concentrate mainly on culture. <laughs> Before we come with maximal demands, like six weeks vacation with sex and with free love, <laughs> we must show the angels that we are sinners with spiritual goals. I propose that we publish a magazine. <laughs> a magazine in Gehenna? <laughs> yes, a magazine. And its name should be the Gehenna Mnik. <laughs> when you sign a petition, the angels take one look at it and they throw it away. Or they blow their noses into it. But a magazine they would read. The, the righteous in paradise expire from boredom. <laughs> they are overfed with the secrets of the Torah. They want to know what's going on in hell. <laughs> they, they are curious about our view of the world, our way of thinking, our sex fantasies. <laughs> and most of all, they are intrigued by the fact that we are still atheists. A series of articles, the atheist in Gehenna would become a smash hit in paradise. <laughs> of course, of course, we would also publish a gossip column and a lot of special hell pornography. The saints would have something to enjoy and to complain about. Silly bubble, I'm going to sleep high in bonds, yawned. Who is going to do all this scribbling? And how will this help us, asked a sinner with a hoarse voice. You don't have to worry about who will do the writing, said the sinner with eyeglasses. We have a lot of, of writers here. I was a, a writer on the earth myself. I was condemned to hell because I was supposed to be a rebel rouser. Every Monday and Thursday, I changed my opinion. When it was profitable to preach communism, I became an ardent communist. And likewise, I preached capitalism when that paid. They heaped accusations against me, but the fact is that I had many readers, and they wrote me enthusiastic fan letters. It is true that I changed my opinions like loaves, but were my readers any more consistent? As here in hell, a sinner who looked young and had long hair reaching down to his shoulders asked, why publish a magazine? Why not open a theater? We have here a shortage of paper. Besides, it is so hot here that the magazine will catch fire. The righteous are all half blind and don't understand our modern language and are not accustomed to our spelling. My advice is that we should organize a theatrical group. <laughs> a theater in hell? Who is going to play and who is going to attend? They punish us day and night. We will play on the Sabbath and on all holidays. Are there any scripts in Gehenna? I have an idea for a play. A love affair between a sinner and a saint. <laughs> what kind of love affair? The wicked and the saints never meet. <laughs> I have thought about it thoroughly. My hero is lying on his bed of nails and screaming. <coughs> He's an opera singer by profession. <laughs> and so wrecked with pain that he breaks out into an aria. She, the saint, hears his song 
and falls madly in love with his voice. And then, but the saints in paradise are all deaf. This one happens not to be deaf. <laughs> well then, what follows? <coughs> to be able to meet she, the saint, hears his song and falls madly in love with his voice. And then, but the saints in paradise are all deaf. This one happens not to be deaf. <laughs> well then, what follows? <coughs> to be able to meet him, she asks for permission from the angel Ashiel to dress up like a demon and become one who dispenses lashes and Gehenna. Permission is granted, and so the two lovers meet. She is supposed to whip him, but when the angel Duma looks away, she covers him with kisses, and they soon reach a point where they, can, where they cannot be one without the other. Melodram of the worst kind. <laughs> <laughs> what do you want to play in Gehenna? Miguel Laws by Rabbi Moshe Chaim Lutzate. Our sinners love action. A play like this would give the actors an opportunity to sing a song, to dance, and to make a couple of spicy jokes. <laughs> <coughs> Assuming that it will work, what would be the result? <laughs> Theater is the best form of propaganda. <coughs> <coughs> it may very well be that the saints and the angels will visit our theater to see our plays. And between one act and the other, we would explain to them our point of view, our situation, and our philosophy. Your play is not realistic, and your plan is not realistic. Where will we play? Among the piles of coals? The saints will not come here. All day long they are busy with the secrets of the Torah and with Munchik Leviathan. In the evening, they are afraid to leave paradise. What are they afraid of? Oh, a couple of murderers and rapers manage to escape from Gehenna. They prowl around all night. They have already killed several saints and have tried to ravish Sarah, the daughter of Tovin. I hear this for the first time. Of course, as long as you don't have any magazine, no one is informed about anything. <laughs> The magazine would give us news and explain. Fantasies, fantasies, called out a sinner who had become a politician on earth. Culture will not solve our problem and neither will the theater. What we really need is a political party built on democratic principles. We don't need to come out with impossible demands, Comrade Yankee. We should be satisfied with a minimum. I have heard from a very reliable source that there is a liberal group among the angels who are asking for reforms in Gehenna. What kind of reforms? They want us to have a five-day Gehenna week. Besides Saturday and holiday, we should be given a week vacation in the world of illusions. Some of them would request that the nails on the beds of nails should be two millimeters shorter. <coughs> I was told that there is some change in their attitude toward homosexuality, lesbianism, and certainly masturbation. We could do a lot, but we need money. <laughs> money? All the sinners called out with one voice. Yes, money. What do you know? And money answers all things, Ecclesiastes has said. If we had money, we could achieve everything without revolution, without petitions, without culture. In Gehenna, as everywhere else, everybody has his price. You are all a bunch of greenhorns. I know Gehenna from top to bottom and inside out. With money, we could even the politician wanted to tell us listeners what else could be accomplished with money in Gehenna. But at that instant, the Sabbath ended. The fires leaped up again, 
The nails on the beds of nails began to glow with heat again. The punished demons grabbed up their rods, and a lashing and a whipping and a hanging and a wailing erupted once more. The politician who just spoke about money winked a eye toward one of the older demons, and both of them left, where no one knew, most probably to play cards and to engage in conversation about some non-kosher Gehenna business. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. La ladies and gentlemen, I have promised to answer questions whether I know the answers or not. <laughs> My problem is not if I know the answer. My problem is if I hear the question. <laughs> so if the lady here will help me, I will put on my special glasses for hearing questions <laughs> and, we will, and we will do it. Can you, all, you, all you need to do is lift up a hand and ask. Of course, you don't need to ask me as, about uh, what's going on in Gehenna. We know, we know, we all know what's. All we have to do is look what's going on here, but any questions? Let me hear, or let me see. Maybe you could make a uh, light here, so if I see the people, it's easier for me to, to also to answer the question, or at least, can you make light? No, anyhow, let it be as it is. All you need is lift up a hand and ask. Yes. Would you discuss that briefly? Tell us a little about The lady tells me that a play of mine is being is, is being <laughs> done in Washington and I should discuss it. Well, all I can tell you is the play is is, is based on a story of mine called Tybele the Demon. This is the story. It's to in a few words it's a story about uh, a tutor who fooled a woman, an a, a Naguna, a deserted wife. He, he made her believe that he's a demon and, and, and he compelled her, so to say, to live with him. If not, he would, he would do what demons can do to human beings. It's, it's a strange kind of a story. It was published in a, in a, in a collection of mine called Sh Sh Short Friday. In this, and now they are making a play of it. As a matter of fact, the play was done by me and with the collaboration of Miss Friedman and they are trying it out in Washington. I hope that they will bring it here, that's all I can say. Thank you. Yes, please. The lady says that some people have a, have a theory that men write differently like women. Not only do men write differently than, than, than women, but men write differently than other men. <laughs> <laughs> the very essence of literature is, is based on individuality. Literature is actually the law of individuality. So of course women write differently than men, and one woman write, writes differently than another woman, and one man writes differently than another man. The, the fact that writers write differently makes literature. God forbid if, should, if they should all write a, a, a alike. <laughs> but, <clears throat> but I must tell you, ladies and gentlemen, that this danger that they should all right alike exists, it exists in all times. I've seen it exist in, in let's say, in Hebrew, which is, was called a kind of a barbaric epoch, where the fashion became to write obscure, in obscure kind of Hebrew, words which, which 
Only the, the scholars could understand, or no one could understand. And words which really the writers themselves created. And it became such a fashion that for a hundred years or so, this fashion ruled Hebrew literature. I have seen it happen in many countries, and I have seen it, it's happening, as a matter of fact, almost everywhere. Literature becomes a fashion and all people begin to write not completely alike, but more or less alike. When you read their anthologies, you are astonished to see, you ask yourself, who mimicked whom? And this danger is in our time, right here, very great. Because there are theories now about literature, theories about the, of explanation, of psychological explanations, and of sociological messages, and many uh, writers take these theories so, so seriously that they really begin to write according to this recipe. So let me tell you, my dear lady, the, the, there is no danger, really, that, that, uh, that the readers will, will come to a, to a realization that men are better writers or women are better writers. Our problem is the problem that we are many writers lose their individuality and succumb to, to fashion. So this, this is, uh, according to my feeling, the danger of our time. We are, there is the danger of a, of a barbaric epoch in world literature. Yes, please. The gentleman asked me to speak about the revival of Yiddish literature in Israel. I wouldn't say that there is a special revival. There are a number of Yiddish writers from, from Poland, survivors from Hitler or, people, or writers from Soviet Russia, and they continue to write in Yiddish. And of course, we still have a lot of Yiddish readers in Israel. We have a newspaper. How long this will last, no one knows. Uh, the only uh, revival you may think about is that, the, that the, in Israel, the government and also the, the professors have become more lenient to Yiddish. There was a time when Yiddish was taboo in Israel. They, they were in a great fear that Yiddish may take the place of Hebrew. This danger is over, and now the uh, people feel that we should not forget the Yiddish language and the 600 years of Jewish history connected with this language. Let's not forget that the Baal Shem, Rabbi Nachman Bratzlover, all our great writers and all our great scholars in, 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 in uh, Eastern Europe and even in Germany spoke Yiddish. Yiddish contains so many treasures, literary and historic and folklore and whatnot, that it would be a great shame to forget it. In this respect, I think there is a, a revival. Not a revival on actual, but a revival of the minds. People have begun to understand in Israel that in forgetting Yiddish is not a great gain, the very opposite. It would constitute a great loss. The lady wants to know I, if I'm shocked about the great... I will tell you the truth. So I'm sometimes shocked. It is true that the rate of divorce is, is, uh, is one third. But I'm shocked that two thirds still live together. <laughs> because, because there is so much propaganda against the institution of marriage. All the plays and all the dramas and all the all the novels and this and what not, all the shows keep on attacking the institution of marriage. And the fact that two thirds of the population still live together and have children and ignore all, ignore all these attacks shows that there is something very strong about the institution of marriage. <laughs> and I want, before, before the next question, I want to tell you where the strength lies. First of all, there's nothing who could take the place of marriage. Because if a man and a woman really love another, there is a natural instinct that they would like to stay together, not only for a week or two weeks or a month, 
but this, for life, when people love one another, they always say, I will always love you, and this is, so this keeps marriage uh, together. The other thing is, I once spoke to a man who was supposed to be in the Warsaw, a great uh, Don Juan, and suddenly he got married. And I said to him, why did you get married? And he told me, he said, I have, I have had lovers and I have lovers. And I used to go with them to hotels. And I used always, when I, first of all, the woman was always ashamed to go to the hotel. No matter how she loved me, she was embarrassed. And I was embarrassed too. In addition, I had all the time to look at my watch, but we, we had to hire the hotel for two hours. You know how it is there. People were not rich. He, <laughs> he said to me, I, was, I, was, I, I am only potent with a woman if I can be with her relaxed. And I have convinced myself that never is a man more relaxed with a woman than, than if he marries her. So whatever trouble I have with my lovers, I have no trouble at all with my wife. It may sound to you like a joke, but there is a spark of truth in it, or ayata. Did you, uh, the lady asked me if I've ever belonged to a writer's club here in America. You show me a writer's club here in America, and maybe I will belong to it. <laughs> there isn't such a thing. The writers here keep away one from the other. You don't have this atmosphere which I described here in this story, one will cover. Somehow, the competition is great, also the distances where people from one writer to the other from. There are many reasons. When I came to this country, I was almost sick. I tried to convince my other people, let's have a Yiddish writers club. And they all told me the same thing. If a writer, one writer lives in the Bronx and one in Brooklyn, they have to travel two hours by express to go there and, and the way back. America is just not made for writers club, I would say that I, I, I try to convince people so long that we can have it until I convince myself that we cannot have it. <laughs> I wish we could have it. Yes, please. The lady wants to know if some of my plays have been adapted to film. I would say one full film came out now of the magician of Lublin. And when I saw it, I was so ashamed <laughs> that I am afraid. I, I think I, I f feel like praying to God that sh never should anything like this be repeat. <laughs> this doesn't mean that it cannot happen, but I, I would say I, I would like uh, to see a good film, but uh, a bad, for a bad film, I'm not looking forward to. Yes, please. A lot of his stories have demons. Do you believe in the existence of demons? The gentleman wants to know if I do believe in demons. Of course, I have been writing about demons all my life. And I use demons, to me, demons is a way of uh, a literary kind of symbol, a method of expressing thoughts and ideas or emotions which I could not express differently. But in addition to this, I also believe in demons. <laughs> <laughs> and I, and I, I have proof, proof from it. When my, proof for it, when, when, when my way Five goes away and I stay alone in my apartment. I let the lamp uh, burn in, my, in the bedroom the whole night, being afraid that one of the demons, some of the demons I created myself in my writing, may come to me and take revenge. <laughs> but let's be uh, serious for a moment. Many scientists have come out and they say the that everything which we call supernatural is nonsense. And their argument is that there is no clear evidence of, the, of what we call supernatural. 
There is not until today any clear evidence of telepathy, clairvoyance, uh, premonitions, and such things. But I have convinced myself that we, we all believe in many, many things for which there is no clear evidence. As a matter of fact, when a father takes a walk with his children, introduces them, these are my children, you cannot say that he has <laughs> clear scientific evidence that they are his children. But somehow, men, you, there would be no, fa no fathers if, 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 if people would, would demand clear scientific evidence. Very few. This is not the only example. There are many, many others. There is really, there is really no evidence, for example, that Shakespeare had more talent, let's say, than the, those who write the, the, the kitsch plays in our time. This. Still, we, we, we make peace that not everything must have evidence. And I think that the cases, what we call supernatural, although we cannot have uh, clear-cut evidence, every one of us, or many of us, had had cases in their lives where really they bege began to believe, or at least for a time, that there is something which we call supernatural. And because of this, we have to live with it. And uh, I also have the conviction that in the future, let's say in the 21st century, more research will be done in, in this field. I, I don't promise myself that we will find the evidence, the clear evidence then, but we will know more about it than we know today. So this is the reason I really believe that we are surrounded by powers of which we have no inkling, but they still exist and influence our lives. Yes, please. <laughs> I want to ask you what it was like for you to get the Nobel Prize, what it meant to you. The lady wants to know what it is, how it is like getting the Nobel Prize. I will tell you, it is true that I was surprised, but no surprise lasts longer than three seconds. <laughs> Let's say if one would come to you suddenly, you would say, you won on the, on the lottery a million dollars. You would be surprised a few seconds, and then after the few seconds, you would say, yes, I won the million dollars, and I have to live with it. <laughs> I must tell you that although they are writers who, who expect uh, the Nobel Prize and even work on it, write letters and all kinds of things, I was never a candidate, not even, not even in my mind or in my hopes. Being a Yiddish writer, I knew what, what my chances are. I was already in, in, in my 40s when they began to translate me into English. Until then, I lived with the idea that I'm going to write for Yiddish-speaking uh, readers here in America, and this will be my lot. And when they began to translate me from being translated and, and publishing somewhere in this or that magazine until the Nobel Prize is a far cry. So I never expected it, and, and, uh, but I was just as, just as happy as, as any other writer. I, I said to myself, where is it written that every writer must have millions of readers? He can be satisfied with hundreds of readers. But this year when I got the Nobel Prize, I, 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 we were living in, in somewhere in, in Florida near, near Miami Beach, and we, I always went down, we, every morning for breakfast to a drugstore there where I get oatmeal. I, I like oatmeal. <laughs> and I went there and my wife was supposed to come five minutes later. Instead she came ten minutes later. And I said to her, why are you late? What, what, what are you doing? She said, they say you got the Nobel Prize. <laughs> I, I said, who says it? She, she says, some woman in, has heard it on the radio. I said, don't be silly. <laughs> this is another time of the Nobel Prize and no one is going to, get, to give it to me. Let's have breakfast. <laughs> and I had a very leisure breakfast. And this is, and then I, I, I went home and when I neared the house where I live, I saw already photographers 
and cameras and all the other things and the turmoil began. Well, all I can tell you is I'm the same man, of course I'm the same man, but at no price changes a man. And I also don't have the, the I don't fool myself that because I, I got the Nobel Prize, I'm something better than, than other writers. Many of the great writers didn't get the Nobel Prize. Of course, I was glad to get this recognition, but my duties and my way of work are the same as they were before. The lady wants to know if I worry about it, that Yiddish is a dying language because she worries about it. <laughs> I'm, very, I'm very glad that there is someone else who worries about it, except me. Sometimes I have the feeling that I'm the only one who worries about it, which is far from being true. I will tell you, I'm not silly enough to be so optim op an optimist and say that uh, Yiddish is in a very good situation. The situation is very bad. Our children don't speak Yiddish here in this country, and whether if our grandchildren will speak it is a, is a big question. I don't know why they would, they would speak it. The only thing I can say is, it is my deepest conviction that Yiddish and Yiddish literature will never be forgotten. And I want to repeat you here uh, something which I, I might have told you or some others, that when I sit with my cronies in the, uh, in the cafeteria near the forwards, and they begin to bother me, what will happen to Yiddish, what will sein der Tachlis? I tell them, I have some comfort for you. And they say, what kind of comfort? I say, we are having now the world about four billion people. But in a hundred years, we might have 50 billion people, or 100 billion people, the way we multiply. And every one of these 100 billion people will need a topic for a PhD. <laughs> and, you, and you can imagine, I tell them, what they will do to Yiddish. <laughs> they will bring out each book, good or bad, each manuscript, and write dissertations by the millions. As a matter of fact, I don't worry about it that Yiddish is going to be forgotten. What I worry about it, that in a hundred years from now, the, the the desire for Yiddish and research of Yiddish will be so great that they will exaggerate and they will make believe that mediocre Yiddish books were really very great. Actually, in Yiddish, like in any other language, talent is a rare, rare thing. So as I told you, I don't worry that we Jews will forget Yiddish. We haven't forgotten Aramaic, we, ha we haven't forgotten Hebrew, and even, even what is this name, the Sephardic name? Ladina is not yet forgotten, and Yiddish will also not be forgotten. The gentleman or the lady who it is. Do you see a relationship between religion and literature? The lady asked me if there is a relation between religion and literature. Literature has a relation with everything, with religion, with atheism, with, with... The only thing I can say is, this is my private uh, conviction, that no full-fledged no full -fledged writer has ever been a full-fledged atheist. There is something in a writer, some f feeling of faith. He may, he may quarrel with God, he may not believe in the dogmas, he may be an agnostic, but I, the great writers whom I read were all, had all some kind of affinity with religion. It's, a man must be very superficial to feel that all the wisdom exists here on, on this little earth, on the surface of this little planet. And except for this, there is nothing but blind uh, chaos. As a matter of fact, not long ago came out a book which is called the first three minutes of, where the, of, the words, of the creation of the word, written by a scholar who I think got the, is getting the Nobel Prize this very year. And I read it, and I, although I admired this man's knowledge and his, 
I, I said to myself, according to him, the Big Bang in which he believes, like a, a, a pious Jew believes in, in, in the Mount Sinai, that it happened 20 billion years ago. And he describes with such detail what happened in the first three minutes. And I said to myself, here we don't know what is happening two miles or three miles deep in the earth. And there, in this little planet, and there the, a man describes the Big Bang with all the details 20 billion years ago, and he knows exactly what happened. Of course, the book is a very interesting book, and the scholar has done other things than write this book. But it's this kind of belief, I think, it looks to me so strange that I said to myself, it, it's, it would sound to be more probable that God has created heaven and earth, and he said, let there be light. This theory is, uh, is, <laughs> is nearer to my mind than all this knowledge, all this exact knowledge of what happened 20 billion years ago. I think, ladies, that I answer two questions. If I answer the third question, I think I will have to answer all the questions for these 20 billion years. I, I, the only word I had in, in men say is the Jewish mother. What advice do you have for the son of a chronically Jewish mother? What advice I have for the Jew? I will tell you, the word Jewish mother is nothing but a cliche. A silly generation, the, how to say? Generalization. There isn't, a Jew, the word Jewish mother expresses the idea that all Jewish mothers are alike. It is as we know that even our fingerprint that our fingerprints are not alike. Every human being has a di has a something different in his fingerprints. That if he, God forbid, commits a crime, he could be found. So to say that all the Jewish mothers are alike and that they need a special remedy, what what I should do with them? <laughs> it is the whole business is a lie and false from the beginning to the end. I, hap I, hap I happen to know hundreds or perhaps thousands of Jewish mothers, and I don't see them alike. I admire how much individuality they have. So let's not make any fuss about silly cliches. Ladies and gentlemen, it was a great pleasure to talk to you. Thanks for listening. For more information on the 92nd Street Y New York and all of our programs, please visit us at 92ny.org.